Welcome, everybody. You have made your way to the program for the meeting of the week of May 11th, 2015 for the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley. And it's our, our pleasure today to welcome two folks from across the world. We have our, our presenters sitting in chairs in Singapore, and they're going to talk to us about the future of libraries. It's always our goal to talk about innovative approaches to education, to entrepreneurship, uh, and to finding those ways that we can use technology to serve the business of service. So with that, uh, I want to say that we have uh, with us two members of the staff of the Singapore American School. Uh, the first is uh, Doug Tendall. He was uh, in the United States Army, uh, posted in Afghanistan for a number of years, and is now a technology uh, part of the technology team at the Singapore American School. And Ron Starker. Ron Starker is the middle school librarian at the Singapore American School. He has uh, worked uh, across the world in the United States, in uh, Belgium, Austria, and of course Singapore. And is a really good guy. I know this because I had the chance to kind of stay with him and his family for, for a few days a couple of years ago. And you know he, had, he and I had the chance to climb the highest mountain in Singapore, which uh, isn't saying that much, uh, and, and getting some wonderful, wonderful Indian food in, in uh, in Little India and in, in, in that wonderful and incredible city. So with that, I am going to hand the program over to our, our two guests. We are very, very pleased to have you, and thank you very much for being here. Thank you very much, Rustin. It's a pleasure to join you guys. Um, we do a little R&D today. That's I'm Ron, and he's Doug. <laughs> and uh, we'd like to talk about libraries and where we see them going. Um, and we'll, we'll show you a model we're trying out. It's not, we don't think we have the answer, but we have some uh, things that might be useful to people to think about out there. So, Doug, if you can just start off with our first slide. Um, one great library that's out there at the moment is at North Carolina State. And if you get a chance, click on this. I'm not going to play this video, but it is a really good video. And it's called the Hunt Library. And it really looks at what libraries might become. It's, it's got uh, a lot of interesting ways to... Uh, allow people to collaborate, create, innovate. Uh, it's not just a place where you store books. And the interesting thing about their model is that they looked back at the um, Great Library of Alexandria. And uh, um, the architects who designed the new Library of Alexandria are the same architects who designed the Hunt Library. So when we started looking at libraries of the future, we thought, what about a remix? What if we looked back to the best library we could think of and we looked at the Great Library of Alexandria. If you can just shoot to that, Doug. Um, we don't know what it looked like. This is a you know a depiction of a place that is really more like a university than a library. The, the, the concept was much broader back then. The Library of Alexandria was on the port. When ships came through, they actually stopped the ships and they would take any documents aboard a ship from various countries and they would copy those documents and then they would put them in the library. They had a place for kind of like what Doug called the first TED Talks. They had people like the Princess High Princess Hypatia talking about her developments with algebra. They had people from all around the planet coming and actually doing sabbaticals that time back. They had a zoo. They had an astronomy lab. They had all kinds of things that we don't associate with libraries. So we like to go back to the good old days and think of a library as an innovation center and a place where you can read and support books. And we'll kind of take you on some of our ideas there. So this is what I might call a big remix. First, a warning. There is a tsunami coming. It's hitting schools, libraries, and all the rest of us. Um, it, I don't think it's overstating that all the changes happening in the digital world right now, we all kind of recognize it. And I think this audience we're talking to gets it. I don't have to belabor the point, but if we can just go on to the next slide and show that I'm talking about forces that are driving change. Uh, a digital revolution to the point where we're talking about the Internet of Things, where everything from my refrigerator reminding me that you know the milk's gone bad to you name it, uh, the sofa adjusting to me to make me comfortable. Globalization, we're seeing it right now. Here you're in San Francisco, we're in Singapore. It, it doesn't really matter. It's a flat playing field. And uh, that affects libraries just as much as anybody else. And then the big one for us is information explosion. Uh, to have things go at such a rapid pace, and acceleration comes with that. Let's just look at some of the slides that kind of depict this, Doug. Um, well, first of all, sometimes in the tech world, we get a little hung up on bits and bytes. 
And I think what librarians want to value along with that is content. You know, if you took the complete works of Shakespeare and you measured it in terms of bytes, it's really only enough data to make a low-resolution video. But in terms of content, it's amazingly more significant and amazingly more powerful than you can ever do in a one-minute video. So I don't want to lose sight of content as well as just data and uh, information that way. Uh, we want to move beyond information to knowledge and you know hopefully wisdom at some point. Um, tell you what I can do this, but in in the in the process we don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some people saying you should get rid of the name library. It's antiquated. Move on to something new. We even have colleagues here at the school who want to change the name of of the high school library to an IHUB Innovation Center, which I have no problem with, but what I worry about is we don't want to give up some of the great library values that have been built up over the centuries, you know, protection of confidentiality, respect for all kinds of information, different points of view, all those kind of things that, that uh, the library associations in America and other countries have really taken a lot of thought and time to. So let's not throw the baby out with the bathwater. There are some things the libraries have said you need to do this, you need to teach people about uh, information literacies. We're in, inundated with all kinds of information and digital uh, uh, approaches and, and social media that we need to kind of let people uh, have some training in how to interpret those literacies. So I'm not going to talk about this much at this thing, but that definitely would be integral to our program. So um, what we came up with was we were looking for a way that we could connect things. It seems like education is often fragmenting. We were cutting it you know, into smaller and smaller segments. So how can we show that there is actually a connection between, let's say, you know, music and mathematics or art and history or literature and science? You know, all these things do connect. And, I, and so we came up with the idea of a connections project, a global classroom. Um, to start that off with, uh, we met with our, our stakeholders, um, administrators, teachers, parents, students, and we have what we call dream workshops. And we let people think about where do you get your best ideas? Where do you really get a lot of work done? Where, do you, um, where are you able to be really productive? And, and we got some good ideas from that. And some people said, you know, that was the coffee shop down, down at Starbucks or whatever. Or other people said they needed a quiet, serene space. So there was a lot of variation. And out of that, uh, it confirmed some thoughts we had. And uh, when we did a Wordle on the, all the dialogue we captured from the, from the Dream Workshops, we compared that with a Wordle of uh, a ton of papers we were reading on research. And the two Wordles really matched up. There was, a, there was a really good alignment, and that kind of felt good. So we felt like we had faculty, staff, uh, parents, a lot of people behind us on this idea. So I'm going to jump now. That idea uh, has been reshaped a number of ways. I'm just going to kind of go through the facilities here to show you um, how we approach library work here. We have a tech help center, and in that center we can have students or teachers come in, and we got some coaches there, and people will help them out. Um, we're an Apple-based school, so uh, you'll see Apple on the background there, and it just that's a common platform we have. Um, there are a lot of challenges as we go about this process, and these challenges have not changed since libraries started, but they're still essential. Core knowledge. Schools have to work out what do we consider core knowledge that has to be taught, and what time can we allocate for skill development? Because with exponential increase in knowledge, we can't keep up. We can't teach fast enough to give kids everything they need to know. So the core knowledge has become too large. So part of it is helping identify essential core knowledge. And li libraries do that. We curate, we filter, we try to find the best stuff. So the best resources of information that are available. But along with that, we think that it's important to develop thinking skills. Part of that is but the model we took was Howard Gardner's model out of Harvard University. It's not new. came out around 96. has a lot of research behind it of multiple intelligences. And I worked uh, as a counselor for a number of years and trained as a school psychologist as well. So I, I gave a lot of IQ tests. And the, and the problem when you give an IQ test and you get a number like somebody, average medical student says 125 IQ, is that, well, how's that person doing music? Or how's that person as an artist? It doesn't measure that. And so multiple intelligence were sort of necessary to look at how we adapt to our environment in other ways than just a, uh, an IQ number. Now to go back to the facility, we, we tried to set up several features. One is we had an area called the Central Connection. As you can see, it's got a folding wall there. It's an area where we would have a hub of, of uh, coaches. We don't have it yet. We have a tech coach 
an ed tech uh, um, coordinator, and a literacy coach. And we're hoping maybe we can get math and science and a few things in there as well so that people can come to us, a teacher, and bring us their lesson plan and we can kind of, um, as you might say on the TV show, Pimp My Ride, to incre increase the impact and the learning that that, that uh, lesson plan can have. It might involve technology, it might not. Um, so that's the inside area there. It's very flexible. The tables fold up, the chairs fold up, we can move it around and we use that area quite a bit. This area out here we call the collaborative side. It's kind of googly. It's got some uh, interesting furniture. You can see the tables have been cut down. The legs are down. The students in the high school have painted murals on top of those tables. We have the flags of the countries of the school because we feel that's important to some sense of identity. And you can see we've got books. We are we're a traditional in that sense. We've got about 28,000 um, print books. And we have another 6,000 digital ebooks. Um, this side of the library we would like to change into an R&D center for emerging technologies. The idea being that there's so much interesting tools, so many interesting tools out there that you can't just go out and buy, let's say, Oculus Rift for every classroom and say, is this going to be useful for education? So instead, what if you tried it out in the library? You let students try it, you let teachers try it, and then you got some feedback and you assess that. So that's what we mean by an R&D Center for Emerging Technologies. We're not there yet, but we'll show you a few things we have uh, been experimenting with. The other side of the library is a more traditional library. If you like uh, what came out of your part of the world, a Walden Zone, maybe. We, we don't uh, ban computers in this area, but we do keep it more of a, of a book side to things. And you can see the, the mural on top of the, the walls there is the solar system, so we can kind of convey a place of exploration. Again, everything's pretty flexible. We can flip the tabletops up. Everything moves on wheels. We're going to get chairs on wheels soon. And that gives us an ability to try a different kind of approach there. In between, uh, those cubbies, you see, there are little cubbies built in that we um, call caves. And if you've ever read the article by David Thornton, uh, brain specialist, you kind of want to have four types of settings in a library. One would be um, like this. It would be uh, these little cave areas are places you can have some solitude and you can think on your own. Another would be a big area where you have a screen and a projector and a large viewing area. We call that the mountaintop. And a third area might be where you gather in small groups uh, and talk in, in groups and brainstorm that way, and that may be seen as a campfire. And finally, the fourth area would be an area that uh, provides you with some informal ability to, to have conversation with people, sort of like that coffee shop. And we do a breakfast every month in the library, as well as we have a little kitchenette area in the back where you can actually just talk to people in a kind of informal way and share information. Doug, you can break in at any moment here. Uh, I've been <laughs> dominating the conversation, but um, what's your impression with what we're doing with ebooks right now? Any thoughts on that? So right now we're um, we're kind of in a touchy spot because in Singapore they unfortunately they don't have WhisperNet or they don't support WhisperNet here, which is the the Kindle platform. And so right now we're we're using Follett and OverDrive, which is pretty darn good for for just general basic stuff, but it's really hard right now. At least in the the, the way that ebooks are functioning, I think in general in the world, as far as getting the newest content and quality books in history. So, as soon as we find a good platform that will work both, uh, you know, just reasonably and on the price point, I think that we'll we'll end up going that way. But right now we use OverDrive and Follett. I'm just going to jump on that price point for a minute because it's so weird now. When you buy books as a librarian, you're actually dealing with an industry that's looking like the music industry 10 years ago. Because when we go to buy books now, an ebook price will change monthly or weekly depending on demand. And so as a librarian, I'm looking for the best buy, but I also want the best books. So it's, it's a very kind of weird situation. We also have to look at formats and all kinds of other accessibility issues. Um, so as we started out, we thought, what can we do with this library that would allow us to innovate a bit and try out some new ideas? One idea was the R&D Center for Emerging Technologies. That's kind of a big idea. A smaller idea is how can we make something like, let's say, a tablet that's, that's not a physical tablet but like a, a little space, and we call those learning design studios. I think I stole that idea from Alan November or somebody else. All of our ideas, by the way, are stolen. We're shameless. <laughs> We're, we've remixed everything, so I don't think I have an original idea in here. But took this idea and we created my old office and made it into a music studio. Now, why would we have a music studio in the library? Because we want to support the eight forms of multiple intelligence. So libraries do a really good job of supporting verbal linguistic intelligence. And that's a big one. That's what schools really hit hard again and again and again. But schools don't often give the same kind of levity or weight or 
importance to music, which I think is awesome. I spend more time doing music or listening to music than I do algebra. Um, so we made a music studio. Now, to make it compatible with a library, uh, this is where Doug came in. We fashioned it so the whole thing could be done in headphones. And uh, we have a picture of that studio. Uh, that, Actually, we'll maybe cut to it. Go ahead. Before we get to that, yeah. one of the so as we did these things, uh, so we did a photography room, we did a, a music studio, we did an environmental uh, environmental room where we can you know we've got uh, displays that show what's going on in the world as far as like forest fires or uh, tsunamis, all mm -hmm. sorts of good stuff. But one of the key things that as we were developing these things, we didn't want to go all out and spend a whole bunch of money making a final product only to have it basically be outdated by the time it was finished. Mm -hmm. So we've kind of taken this design thinking uh, process where we actually do very small prototypes and then iterate as we go through that process. The design-based thinkers call out low, low resolution. You make it out of cardboard maybe to start with it and then you build up it works, you get some traction, then you move on. Now, and we also were not really strict about the intelligences because they overlap. You know, they're, they're not all clean, distinct ones. And if we found something we couldn't fit in one of the eight intelligences, but we thought it was good for learning, no problem. We just we add it to the mix. So this is the studio. This is my old office, and you can see in there, Doug. Why don't you explain what what you got in there? You're the okay. So this, as, so we we actually have a one to one school. So every student in the school has their own laptop. But one of the things, the main things about a library is we want to provide services that you can't get outside the library. So on the, the computer that's in front of there, all the main softwares, you know, uh, all the Adobe products, including um, Logic, which is move fast. Sorry. Oh, Logic, which is one of the big softwares. Anyways, it, it we want to provide things that you can't get outside. The uh, outside the library. We have so much to talk about. We, we know the time's running out, so I'm gonna I'm gonna forge ahead. So that's the music studio. This video is one we'll send you the link to, and it's a bunch of teachers uh, playing Pachelbel's Canon. They went from classical to rock, and that's Steve, our English teacher, playing uh, bass guitar. Um, the Tiger's Eye, Doug. Uh, what do you got going there? So originally, this was a uh, photography studio. There wasn't much in there. It's a really really high ceiling. So what we did is we built a sound cloud, which you can see at the top, their, uh, their sound absorbers suspended in air, and then around the room we isolated uh, with some sound absorption to, to make it so that you could actually film in there and get good audio. Yeah. And you know, if, if, if my old high school, I went to a miserable little high school, I mean, nice people, but terrible facilities called Umatilla High School in Umatilla, Oregon, 650 people, no budget, no money, how would I do this there? I'd find a room, I'd paint the wall white, and I'd have an iPhone. And actually, the most expensive thing is the camera in the middle of the room. Everything else together doesn't cost as much as the camera. So you could use an iPad for all that matters. Yeah. Um, this one we call the living room, and, and I'll grab this one. This is naturalistic intelligence. We had a tough time with this. How do we, we wanted to blow out those walls and put in glass. It cost some money. We didn't do that. We did put some plants in, and we put in uh, some solar collectors off to the side. Uh, which we haven't set up yet, but there's a solar gorilla, a solar monkey, can power some things. We showed some species like the tiger that used to live in Singapore and is now extinct here, but it's about to become extinct worldwide. We have a lot of books on science and technology, and in the background you'll see some stuff playing about the uh, climate change and the earth, and so we do in different infographics on that. The school has the largest um, solar power array in Singapore of any building. We get about one megawatt of energy through solar, and so we want to have a readout there to show people the connection locally what's going on with the global situation. Tell them about this one. Okay, so this is our wellness area. Uh, actually, we've, uh, we've iterated on this since this picture. Um, one of the things that we noticed was the students like to make a whole lot of noise on these things, but we also want to have students interact or actually do an activity while they read. Uh, it's actually more of a psychology thing. I, well, you know, there's a school outside of Chicago, you're from Chicago area, uh, and they, they, they've shown that they do a pre and post test measures on the exercise. The kids' math, science, English scores improved, and they, they really collect a lot of data on this. So we found that this is not to get fit. This is a quick get some movement. You had 11, 12, 13-year-olds who have been sitting in classrooms. Maybe some were boring, and we want them to move around a little bit. That seems to improve memory. It seems to improve attention span. Stanford University came out with some good stuff on the, the walking treadmill stuff. And we eventually would like to do a little measurements on biofeedback, find out what the stress levels are, because sometimes, quite frankly, our school SAS is called stress AS, and we try to reduce that a bit. I'll move on. 
Okay, so these are some of the emerging like technologies. That picture. Is that rush to visit? It, it does a bit. It does, it does a bit. Oh, yeah. anyway. anyway, so these are uh, a bunch of the emerging technologies. Some, actually, the Wacom's not so much emerging. But these are things that we are using right now in our spaces. Um, but you've got the 3D printer. We're actually not using the MakerBot anymore. We're using the Ultimaker. Uh, and then ZSpace is something new as far as it's virtual reality. Oculus is virtual reality. We're really looking forward to the Holo. Hopefully that comes out in the next year. Um, anyway, so we tie a lot of these things together into a design space so that you can build, render, all 3D. Uh, you can do 3D games. You can do 3D animations. You can do 3D printing from Photoshop or if you're using Illustrator or any of those, any of those things. So our, our goal is how can we get kids excited about learning, get teachers excited, and, and also see, is this really fundamental? Is this going to help us learn more, or is it just bells and whistles? And, and so we only do it by testing out, let the stakeholders see, what would you do with this device? How could you, how could you make it uh, applicable? Gaming is big, and libraries actually are supporting gaming in a huge way. So uh, we actually have to temper this with just clicking on a game and mindlessly playing it to actually developing games, getting kids to where they can uh, move along to higher levels. And of course, gamification is kind of a whole other issue there. It's big. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but we do have uh, areas in the library where we uh, support and try to help our gamers. So where are we going? Well, we use the Horizon Report quite a bit. We use a lot of other things to guide us. Um, I really like this uh, Gartner Curve. I don't know if you guys have looked at this before, but it kind of shows it's a Gartner Curve. Uh, when something's adopted, there's this big rush of you know enthusiasm about it. It hits a peak, and then people find out, well, maybe it's not the panacea. It doesn't solve everything, and then there's this drop. And then if it's good, it gets traction. It starts to take off. So we're looking at these things to say, well, what should we try next? What might work well? And, uh, and how much can we sustain and tackle at a time? Because it, we have our regular library jobs on top of this kind of innovation stuff. Um, so ideally, we would like to set up a starter kit for even tiny little libraries like my old high school that don't have much money and maybe you could get ideas from us and or other things, but uh, that's kind of down the road. I think that might be our last slide. Maybe we can pop on Doug. But there's a few things here just showing you uh, how we're displaying books. Marketing. Marketing. So yeah. a, lot of, uh, a lot of the things that we're doing as well as looking at libraries as far as they're like bookstores, but we, want, we don't want the business side. We want more of the, the marketing side. And one of the, the big things is showing book face, or book jackets as well as looking at space as is this item actually paying its rent? And if it's not, then it needs to go. Because oh, really. yeah, a big influence on us was a book called *The Third Teacher*. I think it's, it's amazing, and uh, that helped guide our work a lot. We look at stuff from Stanford D School and, and other places like that, and actually visited there. Um, so we're excited about the impact that a setting can have on people. I mean, Churchill said, you know, we shape our buildings, and thereafter they shape us. And we found that to be true. We we move things around, and all of a sudden the kids they, they behave a little differently. We, we shepherded them all into a, this room with the gamers the other day, and it was awesome. <laughs> they were collaborating and working much better together than they were in that bigger outer space. So, anyway, okay, I think that's it. If you can bring us back, uh, we'll show our, our homely mugs here. <laughs> Hope we didn't talk too fast. We want to put as much in as we could. Oh, no, no. 80 words a minute with gusto 120 is perfectly fine. <laughs> <Great>. <laughs> no, no, no. Fabulous stuff. Ron, Doug, yeah. wonderful, wonderful material. I mean, well, you know, this, we, have, we have fun. We have fun. Well, fun's critical, right? I mean, you know, if, if what yeah. you're going to do is help people kind of imagine new possibilities, they have to get into that creative space where they're starting to say, you know, what, what would be cool? You know, what would inspire us yeah. to take this to another level? And exactly. you know, if if fun is not involved, that's just kind of a hard place to get to, I think. We totally agree. We totally agree. We think rigor's been overdone, and joy needs to come into the picture a lot more. Well, and and. And I think that you know you, you see a certain amount of rigor because joy is motivating it, right? Yes, exactly. Absolutely. Joy will lead you there naturally as a motivator. Exactly. Yeah. Absolutely. Now you know I'm, I'm intrigued. You know, for, first of all, on so many different levels, right? For for one, uh, you know, Shags I'll mention, uh, and and I should introduce Shags real quick. Um, you know, uh, in addition to to our presenters, Ron and Doug. Uh, there is also uh, Shags Shagrin, who is a board member of the E Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, and also our, our membership chair for, for our Rotary Club. I am Rushton Hurley. I'm the president of the club. That kind of thing. Yeah, um, but, yeah who is this guy? Um, <laughs> but he was in a slide. But, but also, I was a student at the Singapore American School in the early 70s, so it, it's all the more fun for me to be able to you kind of reconnect with uh, 
a, a place that is a part of my own history, so that's good fun. I was intrigued by one of the things you said regarding gaming. You know, you had that slide with that rather amazing building that uh, looked like it was, uh, uh, you know, built out of uh, Minecraft. I mean, I is, that, is that something that teachers are using at the school? Well, you know, uh, I thought I created that application of Minecraft with the curriculum was we do an Egypt project for sixth grade, and kids build an artifact. Well, we had a kid make an amazing temple on Minecraft, and it had so much detail in it. It was a, it was a, a whole temple of artifacts, not just one. And I thought that's, that's a great application of a game, uh, and, and the kid was so motivated, so loved it. Um, but, yeah, there's a, there's a lot of games out there that... Uh, that kids are working on. What, what's fun is when you talk to them, you'll say, well, how long have you been playing this game? And someone might say three years, and kind of go, well, that was a waste of time. Uh, but then you find out what they've actually learned. And, and kids who are playing games like Civilization, uh, their, in, their knowledge of history and uh, things involved in revolutions and all that, they, it puts it together in a, an amazing way. So gaming, I think, for librarians is storytelling. And it's character development, and it's all that stuff that we get out of books as well. Absolutely. And speaking of storytelling, uh, our, our member Shags is also a, a part of the California Storytelling Association. There's, there's a shirt from the festival that took place in the last few days. Uh, Shags, do you, have, do you have a comment or question for Ron and Doug? The shirt's from the 20th. We just had the 29th. That was fascinating. Because I've been going to the library every couple of weeks ever since I was a little kid. And just to see how it's evolved has, has been amazing. In college, I tended not to go because it was more of a social arena, mm -hmm. and I couldn't get much studying done. I'd need to sequester myself. But now, it's almost as if it's an extension of the student union, but for those who really want to no have more knowledge than, than just fun. Mm -hmm. Learning is, is fun. It is. It is. And I think one, one distinction that's happening with libraries is they have always been a place to access information, but mm -hmm. now they can also be places to create information. You know, the other interesting thing is that he was talking about, like, it, it's more of a social place, but one of the cool things about our library that we've made a, we've made a lot of effort in making sure is, A, is that there is those social places, but we also have places that you can study and places for introverts. Uh, you know, like those caves that he was talking about earlier, they're secluded enough that if you were an introvert, you could go in there and not feel like, people were all over you. But we still do have the big spaces where you can, kids can come in at their lunch and socialize, and we, th we think that that's important. The, uh, uh, the yeah. chance to see, like, the, you had the slide up for, for uh, you know, like a good amount of time that showed the layout of the library, which I found myself, you know, kind of you know, j just intrigued by the, the, the arrangement there. You know, I mean, when we, when we think about the placement of books, for example, and, you know, I mean, you know, even if you are not a teacher, you can kind of imagine... Uh, you know, somebody thinking, oh, well, you know, I've got all these students and I want them to read this book, but how many copies do we have in the library? Well, now, you know, depending on what the book is, that's just not an issue. I mean, I, I, I over the last few years, have kind of gotten into reading a lot of classic literature because it's available for free online, right? You know, I think yeah. the Time Machine, the Portrait of Dorian Gray, Frankenstein, all of these things that, you know, these, these wonderful pieces of, 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 you know, our past, really, our cultural past, are, are something that just, you know, kind of... Uh, Few few clicks away. It's it's an amazing time. It is. It is. I think, uh, you know, I, I still love print, but I think that the, the ebook is is going to be a, um, a bigger leader in the future. But I think you can do all those things that people want. You can have the look and feel and whatever in in an ebook reader. Um, and an enhanced ebook. If I'm reading about biology, I want to see the heart beating. I want to be able to go inside of it and go down the left ventricle and explore down there while I'm reading the text. Um, it's it's got the possibilities for ebooks are, are quite huge. Um, for us, economically, I can buy a, what you call a universal subscriber access to a book that everybody in the building could read the same book at the same time. If you wanted that kind of access, it doesn't cost that much more. So having multiple copies becomes cheaper. So it's kind of getting there. By the way, we're in a room right now. I don't know if we should turn the thing around, or not, but it's called the Top Ten Den. And we try to put the top ten books we think of every genre out there so the student coming in quickly says, what do you recommend I read? We can take them in the den and say, well, if you like fantasy, here's some we think are, are the, the flavors of the month. If you like uh, realistic fiction or adventure or that. So the top ten den it becomes a physical format to kind of showcase uh, our best books that are out there. It also happens to be our gaming ring. Yes, we've, <laughs> we, it does, we do a dual purpose and we're 
try, actually trying to pull the gamers in there to get more books in their hands as well. Oh, that's a teddy bear between you, behind you. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. I mean, just the, the, the you know, the, that sense that uh, I remember. I was thinking about the picture that was was early on in the the presentation of the Alexandria Library, and you know, yeah. with, with you guys having the, uh, uh, the 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 cabinet in the back, you know, the old Chinese cabinet. You know, it's kind of that same feel. Yeah, you can see a bit of the kind of the shelving thing. I I won't. Right. I'll try not to ruin our connection here and and disconnect us, but uh, <laughs> that would be uncool. Well, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you what. Um, I will. I. I will wind this one down. I want to okay. thank uh, Shags for joining us, and 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 particular, uh, particularly Doug and Ron for for taking time to uh, to do this presentation for the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley. Uh, I'll kind of run through the last bits, and I'll run through the last bits, and then I'll ask Ron for for the thirty second version on the coolest thing he's read in the last year, so he can give you know our our uh, our viewers you know a little bit of uh, a little bit of advice on like what to read front. So with that, everyone, uh, thank you very much for, for taking part in this. Uh, I think what you'll, you'll find is that every week here at the Rotary E-Club of Silicon Valley at SiliconValleyRotary.com or RotaryMakeup.org, you're going to find stuff that's interesting about the world of Rotary, a little history about this and that, uh, the kind of projects that we've got going, uh, stuff that will inspire you. We've added the tidbit, so you'll learn an extra little, little bit as well. And, of course, we have these fabulous programs. And so, you know, we, we love that we're, we're getting these, these wonderfully interesting people to, to share their stories about innovation, entrepreneurship, and education uh, with the world via, via our club. So I will, I will pass it back to Ron for his recommendation and then do the last few seconds. We'll give Doug one, too. I don't get one? He, he gets a book as well. So, <laughs> do both. Do both. San Francisco, San Francisco author. She's coming here on May 28th. She's in your neighborhood right now, Ying Kapastein. Written a book called A Revolution is Not a Dinner Party. It's from the Mouse Revolutionary Times. It really patterns his, her family's life and what it's like. It's historical fiction. And uh, Terracotta Warrior, which I think is going to be made into a virtual game. It's like the Chinese Indiana Jones. She'll be here, and those are my two favorite books at the moment. Okay, for all the tech folks, Ready Player One. It's awesome. If you, were, if you grew up in the 80s or anywhere near the 80s, it's that, about virtual be. reality. And it's got a huge amount of pop culture from the 80s in it. It's awesome. Hey, thanks, guys. We really appreciate being invited to join you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you both. Uh, you know, it, it's uh, it's tomorrow in you. Singapore, which is which is which is all the fun as well. Uh, for those of you who, who are still hanging in there, make sure that you you do the the survey b below that says I attended. We 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 need those records, of course. Uh, and then and then make sure to add a comment in the uh, in the discus session below. If you've never used that before, you might have to sign up real quick. But you know, once you're in, you're in, and then that's. That allows you to leave messages and take part in conversations about these wonderful meetings, uh, kind of on an ongoing, ongoing basis. So with that, Xi Mi and Zai Jin. Exactly. That's goodbye in Chinese. All right, right. Xi Xi to you as well. All right. <laughs> All right, everybody. With that, uh, we thank you for for taking part in the Rotary E Club of Silicon Valley, and look forward to seeing you next week. Take care. Cool.